Welcome everyone to Startup Shook. We have Yanni Frivlin from Bird, and we're excited to tell and discuss also his book, Live Like a Startup. And Yanif, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's good. It's good to be here. I'm very excited to find your profile and I've expressed this to you as well because we have a lot of entrepreneurs out there who perhaps don't have the easiest time in the beginning of their journey. And so a story like yours is so inspiring and I can't wait to explore deeply into that. But first, I'd love to know you better. Like what is young Yanif like, you know, childhood background? Amazing. So I, I think in terms of like childhood, it was pretty much a normal childhood. Like nothing, nothing really stood out. I grew up I'm actually like in the periphery of Israel. So I grew up in a small town. Then it was 3,000 people in the a development town. I didn't even know that I was in the periphery because like that was the only thing I knew. So I didn't know anything beyond that. And not a great student, average grades matriculation, et cetera. I never, never did well in, in, in exams. So yeah, played, you know, played like amateur basketball. Hmm. Um, that, uh, you know, had friends, wasn't incredibly popular. or was it not, you know, amidst uh, amazing parents, um, both uh, made Aliyah to Israel before from North America. I met in the kibbutz, grew up, grew up in the kibbutz until I was five years old. Kibbutz is a communal form of living and unique, unique to Israel. Then moved to, again to the development town of Katsrin. That's that's a bit a bit about my uh, my childhood. Actually, in that in the book, so the book is a bit of a live like a startup. It's a it's a biography, but like I call it innovation as a way of life. But the chapter that talks about Katsrin, I mean, my, my childhood, I call it the power of green um, because I grew up in Katsrin, just, you know, the north of Israel where everything is green. It's like waterfalls and whatnot. Um, and I, I think it has a lot of nature has a lot of power in life, you know, uh, growing up. I, I saw that when I was in, you know, more concrete places, like, like when I was in university, I couldn't understand why. I have headaches, like when I was there for, for a long while. And then I understood every time I used to go back to the north, to the Golden Heights, I, I used to feel better. And then I understood that, you know, um, it's super important nature and to do those, uh, to, to, to go back to nature. So, yeah, that's, that's a bit about my, uh, my upbringing up until 18, then did the military for three years. Only then I understood that I was in the periphery because that was the first time I heard um, I heard that, and then meeting people from all around, um, all around Israel. I think the military in Israel is mandatory, and I think one good thing about it is like it's a bit of a melting pot, right? Because um, everybody does it, uh, so you get to learn more about Israeli society. For me, that was like also the if you see the book, it's uh, the the the. Um, there's a roller coaster on it. That to me is like I think life is a roller coaster in general. Like we we hop on the rides of life. The set of life is our roller coaster of life is, is a part of all the all the all the rides. We're like an amusement park. So like all the rides together are, are our life. And I actually think growing up in the north when I when I came to military and after, then suddenly like a whole amusement park opened up in a way. And I actually prefer, you know, I always like to look at things like even things that on the, on the surface can be a downside growing up in that kind of town, not having the access. My money didn't come, my parents didn't come for money and all that. I actually prefer to look at it in a different way that like I left and then a whole amusement park of life, you know, opened up, gave me a lot of motivation, learned stuff. I always say in life, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And if you think about it, think about also yourself as a child, I know, but myself, like if I would look, you know, um, 25 years back, um, I know now things that I didn't know, you know, then and it's amazing to think about that as we learn, you know, in life so much. You mentioned in another podcast that if life's an amusement park, then university is the best ride. That, tell a bit more about that because we are, I'm a student here in Reichman and we have a lot of students who are also aspiring entrepreneurs. They're building their business on the side and it's hard to balance. So tell us a bit about your experience amazing so it's, like, it's just like, a lot of people ask me like do a lot of talks and and whatnot and 
people ask me, should I go to study or should I not go to study? It's a question that, you know, never used to be something that people would ask, but today, and I think it's great. I think people should ask questions. I mean, not everything I, you know, also in the book I write about is Israelis that after the military, they go to do their traveling. Like everybody travels and um, people go to South America. So everybody goes to South America. I call it the, uh, because hummus is so big in Israel, I call it like the hummus trail because everybody does the same trail. Everybody goes the same way. So I actually like people asking questions and not going down a route because their friends did it or because other people did it. But around university, and I always say like, if you're doing something that it progresses you and you're passionate about it and whatnot, maybe that's not the right time to go to university. I will say about university, and mind you, again, I, again, my mature conversation was not ideal. My like SATs were very low. I didn't get accepted. And here in Israel, it's a bit different than other places in the world because you get accepted only based on your matriculation and your SATs, nothing else, which is a stupid system, which I, I vow that I will change it one day right? because it doesn't tell the holistic, the holistic human. Just a small anecdote on that in the book. It might bring friends and family to, to uh, give tips about life. One of them. Um, he's a friend of mine, you know, Sayer Yassin, who's Nas Daily, whoever knows him, he has over 70 million followers. And Nas, his title of his, um, of, his, uh, of his chapter in my book is we're bigger than just numbers. Um, and Nas and uh, Sayer grew up in the north of Israel, not too far away from where I grew up, in a small Arab-Israeli village. Didn't have the, um, the 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 numbers or the SAT or whatnot to go to school in Israel. So he went to Harvard. He applied in Harvard, where they look at you as a holistic human. He said that he's going to change the world through technology, which he actually did. He got a full scholarship, and the rest is history. So small anecdote. I really think that we're more than numbers. I said that because my my scores were really low, so I didn't get accepted into anything I wanted. I went to study in the end political science and sociology, which, which I just liked politics when I was young, but that was really the only thing almost that I got accepted into. But the university to itself was the biggest um, shift in my life. That, like that was the amusement part because if you think about it, the university and you're in an amazing one in Reifman where, where essentially there are just so many rides that you can hop on. Like I always tell students like first year, like in the end, life is a game. Um, advantage of it. And it's a game. That's a given, right? Even if there's scholarships, one person gets a scholarship. We can talk about scholarships later. I never paid a single dime for my university, undergrad in Hebrew, master's at Harvard, Singularity University, McGill, never paid a single dime. Everyone has a story. We can talk about it later on. But again, it's a game. So like, I always recommend to people in like their first year of university, like go look at like all the professors that are in the university, go through the directory, see who you want to connect to, write them because they want to talk to you more than you want to even talk to them. They want it. People don't understand that. And the first year when everybody is like in shock, that's where you should make that dent because mm. that's where you create, you know, your advantage. And for me, like the university, I um, did an, an internship in the Israeli embassy in London. I was an assistant research also. In the university and early on in life in general, it's okay to do things that are in a short time frame. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities there like internships, for instance. Let's take that as an example. I highly recommend for people to do internships. Why? First of all, it's a great way to practice. It's a way, great way to get a breadth of knowledge and experience in what I call your portfolio of life without committing too much. So when I was in Hebrew University, we went to the, the Israeli parliament. The Knesset is in Jerusalem. So we all went to do internships in the Israeli parliament. I'm more in the center of politics in Israel, but I actually went to do my internship in the head of the ultra-Orthodox Sephardic, which couldn't be a party, couldn't be more different than me. But my analysis was, okay, like this is an internship. I do it once a week. It ends after a year. That's it. Let me get out of my comfort zone. Let me do something that will give me much more than, than going to something that I know already. And, and in the end, that was probably one of the best decisions of my life. I actually just wrote yesterday like a thank you note to him because in the end, first of all, I learned about the old Orthodox community, which I didn't know about before. Um, and Yaakov Malgi, that was the name of the person who 
later was the, the Minister of Religious Affairs and other, he wrote me a recommendation letter to Harvard. And I believe it was one of the things that brought me in because they saw that I know how to get out of my comfort zone. I know how to take risks and, and not go for the obvious. And again, mind you, I got into Harvard with probably the worst um, GRE that anyone ever got into. So I think that was a big one. It's an example that during your, your university studies, everything is there for you already. You just need to decide, you know what? And it's a great way, I believe in today's world, more than our parents, much more. And I think it's something that we all need to get is multidisciplinary experience. I believe that, you know, our parent used to be very like one dimensional, right? You used to work for 30 years or whatever it is today because of many reasons, but it's much more uh, multidisciplinary and getting that experience um, in the early days um, in university and um, experiencing getting like tastes of a lot of things also teaches you a lot and also teaches you um, more like soft skills that I really think are necessary for life, like empathy and others, which empathy, like Forbes magazine did a, did a, um, a survey among fortune 500 companies. Um, what is the most important quality for a manager in today's world? And the unanimous result was empathy because in the end, what is empathy in the end, the, the ability to understand the other side, understand what will make them do that move. Um, and I believe that multidisciplinary is very correlated to empathy. To me, I think I have a, a lot of empathy. And I got that both from what we talked about earlier, growing up in the periphery and north, being with other people, going, doing that internship, learning about the old Orthodox. I know how to relate in a way that really promotes. So, and I think in the university in general, you really build your portfolio. So again, I did the internship. I did, I did that. I understood who the researcher I wanted to go with. I did it. By the way, I failed endlessly, but I continued. I tried. It's, it's a great period to, to try out. And I really believe in that. I also, well, there was a point in the second year. First year, I was in the dorms. So it was easy. I was already in there. Second year, I already went to live you know, in, the, in the center of the city. But I said to myself, okay, I need an office in the university. So, cause I, so I don't need to go back right. each time. Went to work in Hilo because then that gave me an office that I can work at. And I always like to look at things in, in a way in the book I write about it. Like, don't go do, to be like, a, you know, a bodyguard or, or a waitress or whatnot. Again, those are great things. And if you need whatever the exact money at that point, you'll probably get like $1 more an hour than you would get to be a research assistant or something else. In the grand scheme of life, like that is not material money. Um, and I like to think about life as a you know bit of a longer term. So if you think about it, the delta that you would get during university, going and do doing the meaningful things, doing what you're doing, like the podcast, other things are will give you much bigger value than going to work in those jobs, which will probably give you that extra dollar. Now that extra dollar is probably I wouldn't say worthless, but worth much less. And, um, years to come, if you get other experience, which is much more valuable, helps you build your portfolio and get ahead in life versus the rest of the crowd. So would you say, even though, of course, the current education system is not holistic, it's not perfect, but there's still so much added value network friends that you can get. Like right now, I'm meeting with you, you know, I would that I wouldn't otherwise been able to if I haven't been in Reichman or whatever. But would you think you would have achieved the level that you are now if you haven't gone to Harvard or to other university? No, I don't. I don't think I would. I, you know, I never know in the end, but I would, I would say that, that, um, well, almost hundred percent, I, I, I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. And I think that that university built my, um, portfolio of life, gave me that opportunities. And I also took advantage of it and played that game. A lot of people don't. So a lot of people come, stay in the library, think about like, I'll never forget when I came to Harvard, like the Dean of Students, like one of the first um, talks we had, was so if you leave Harvard with an A plus, we did something wrong, get degrees. Mm. In the end, what you said, the, the podcast, that it's all about community experiences and people. And that gives you great access to that. I never, I never, did, I never regretted anything in the amusement park that I did. I regretted not hopping on the rides of life. And if you think about it, like the real deals 
when I give talks, there's a great slide that I show. I show my people like giving you like 2B64 to drink at 4 a.m. after a party. Right. And then I say like, never do it at home. That is, and that is like when I brought like 100 people from Harvard to Israel to show them Israel. In the end, those are more important than spending another 20 minutes in the library and getting four more points in your mathematics test. Because mm, in the end, those are the places where the deals are done. Those are the places I can correlate and relate every single thing I've done in life to the person, experience, or community that connected me to that opportunity. And when you think about it in that lens, then never say no. I love it. I love it. I have class right now, but this for me is real education. Talking to people who've done it, talking to people who've traversed the path and can share to other people who are going to do the same. I would love so much to go into your book, Live Like a Startup, but I want to make a quick tangent into Bert, because if you talk about Yannick, you got to talk about Bert. So why, why bring Bert to Israel? Amazing. So for that, we have to go back like six years now. I'm not, not, I haven't been a Bert for the past year and a half. Let, let's go back six years back. So six years back, we're talking about 2018. I remember myself um, sitting in April 2018, Whoever's been to Israel, sitting in Ben Gurion Dizengoff, which is the center of, of Tel Aviv, and drinking coffee with a friend of mine, Sam Rosen, from LA, which I met through when I was working before that in philanthropy, Schusterman, and great entrepreneur from LA, sitting with him, drinking coffee, thinking about life and what the next stage is. For me, and we're looking at the um, private e-scooters, private um, electric bikes, which were huge in Israel, um, and way ahead of the world in general. We're looking at them go by, and then he tells me, do you know this company called Bird? Um, started three months ago in, in um, LA. Like That's where it started. I said, no, I looked it up. Like I think this will be amazing in Israel. And some of these needs to be the first. Um, the first I had that because in the end, like seeing those, private e-scooters, seeing those private um, bikes and um, electric bikes going by. And he connected me to his friend Paige that was working there, connected me to Patrick, who's amazing and started the me operation. So it was only Patrick then out of the US. I wrote a Word document of why I think Bird should be, why I think Tel Aviv should be Bird's first market. Not a trivial decision if you haven't been to Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv is a 450,000 people mm -hmm. city, not yeah. a huge city. But I was living it, so I understood, um, and Patrick as well, the advantages that the city has. I'll give a few, but like, first of all, it's the most congested city in the world. And second of all, very young cities. It adapts to, it's the it's what, what is good for that clientele, right? Up to 60% of the people are less than the age of 40, which is great. There are already bike lanes relatively in, a, in an okay position, also important. And I, I'll never forget, I was, I was interviewed three months after Bird started in Israel. It was December. I was sitting with a Wall Street Journal reporter that came here um, to do an article because, about like artificial meat. Then he saw the e-scooter craze and Bird, and he said, I need to do an, a, a piece about that. Called his editor, told him there's something here that's uh, like nowhere else in the world. Called him up, he said, okay, do it. Uh, he was interviewing me on the beach. And uh, he starts the piece by saying, it's December in Tel Aviv and life is a beach. Um, so like that was saying that the weather here is amazing. You know, it's 19 days of rain throughout the entire year. Doesn't matter. It can be April, whatever. It's 19 days. Like that's amazing because then you can, this is a solution that can be for you like year long. So it essentially had like all those attributes they were perfect. I wrote it in a Word document because, you know, that's what I, I knew. I'm not a big finance guy. Excel's like, I know how to read them. I don't know really how to create them in the level um, you should. And, and then I convinced basically Bird to, um, uh, to to open up the first market here. I was the first GM, uh, general manager of the company in the world, built it. And first employee after Patrick and all of EMEA. So going from that startup phase um, and whatnot. And, and and for me, it was the right point, the right time. Hey, by the way, le, um, entrepreneurship lesson, but I was, you know, I always like to, before I make decisions, also ask people around me, get advice, and then it's my decision, but I like to get advice. I think it's important. 
I was asking people, they told me, you know, Yaniv, are you crazy? Like, Israelis are cheap. No one is going to be willing to pay for this service. Or they told me, in Israelis are, there'll be a lot of vandalism. You're not going to have the, the, the scooters after a week. Or Yaniv, why do you even need shared e-scooters? There's private e-bikes, there's private e-scooters. Isn't that enough? And when they tell you no, 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 know that you're on the right way to success. It's good to also get a few yeses. But when people tell you no, like if, if everybody tells you yes, then start to to to, to be suspicious. Um, because most people, by the way, don't see revolutions. There's a great quote by Henry Ford, which potentially said, potentially not, that the person that created Ford, he said, if you asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. And when that talks about transition from carriages to cars, people couldn't really see that. Um, and I think in general, you know, revolutions are something that most people um, can't see. By the way, when I was sitting in that coffee shop, um, that was the point where I never in my life rode an e-scooter before. I never rode. It's not that I knew e-scooters. I just understood the potential that conceptually could be. Also, e-scooters wasn't my fab. Like, but I, I saw that as an opportunity to create something mm-hmm. and bring it to Israel. So I brought it to Israel and um, yeah, it became the number one market in the world or 450 markets, city of the future. And uh, when it comes to micro mobility um, and just a huge, um, huge success. I love it. I love it because I don't think people understood how non trivial it is to bring a product from a different market to another market. Starbucks didn't work very well in Israel. No. And many other examples out there like McDonald's in Philippines, no Jollibee. Jollibee succeeded, but not McDonald's. So it's amazing that you achieved this. And I think we can dive deeper into how you did that through your book. So Live Like a Startup, what is it about? So Live Like a Startup is what I said earlier. In essence, first of all, it's my biography. But but I like to look at it as like the theme of it is innovation as a way of life. And the tagline is like, take initiative and transform your life. I really believe in it. I also like that you came to the book now after you asked me those questions about my childhood and whatnot. Also, if you read it, like there's nothing extraordinary about me. Like, again, grades, grades not ideal, you know, failed many things in life. Most things, by the way, didn't pass the first time, passed afterwards. I think most people in life, when they get a no, they give up. And I think that the most important thing is to continue trying. I'll take something that was in like the university. I had a, um, I had a, um, a course of public diplomacy from Stanford. Uh, so I came to it the first year, applied. That was like the first year of the program. I failed. I didn't get accepted. Okay. Most people would give up that point. I applied the second year, got accepted, became, got like, I was like ranked one of the top in the class the second year. So I didn't get accepted in the first year. Um, and got that internship, me and, and, and 10 others from the entire 1,500 people to uh, get an internship to the Israeli embassy in, in, in London. I give that example and another one for it. Let's get, take another one and then wrap that thing up. I applied to universities in, in the U.S. I applied to Harvard. I applied to Columbia. I applied to Tufts. Uh, I got accepted into Harvard, which is the number one school for public policy in, in the world. I didn't get accepted into Columbia. No reason why. Much easier to get accepted into Columbia. Pretty much same essays, right. same everything. It might be that the person that read my application the night before had bad sex. We don't know. Sometimes it's not in the end because there's no there's no reason why I didn't. There shouldn't be a reason. It's, yeah. it's both the same. But it's not always related to us. A lot of a lot of time, by the way, it is. And it's also like you get more experience, and then you know the second year. But it's not always about us. Number one. Number two. Try the second year. I tried the second year for some of us. And for me, it was probably more ideal to get there. And it brought me to where I was and built my portfolio. Don't don't give up if you have something. Like continue to try. Um, and I believe you need to continue to try in almost everything. I'll never forget. I launched a bird August 14th, 2018. That was the day. I'll never forget it. Looking at the monitor to see if there even will be rides. Today, it looks like conceptually crazy because... Um, like four years after we launched, like the mayor of Tel Aviv came into like the Israeli SNL to Eretz Nederet. Like he came in on a bird that like how much it transformed, you know, Tel Aviv. But I launched the 14th of August without approval from the city. It launched without approval from the city. I was looking at the monitor because 
I didn't know if people would actually write it. Yeah. And I also had that day I had an interview in um, Channel 2 News, the main newscast, you know, in the evening. And I was interviewing and I literally was stuttering. Like I, I, I couldn't do an interview and, um, and I was stressed, et cetera. Five years later, like I do interviews, like, like I enjoy them because like practice makes improvement. Um, and, and again, most people, a lot of people, if they would do something the first time and it would have been shameful, they wouldn't try again. But I think the most important thing is to try again. Um, failures, I learned more from my failures and then I learned from my successes. I learned from both, but I learned a lot from my failures as well. I want to talk about your two points. One, it's not always your fault. And that relates to meritocracy. You, people are so obsessed with their work and their results, but sometimes they blame themselves too much thinking they don't try hard enough, but really they don't control all the factors that come into play, right? But second, also about minimizing regret. You talk about writing all the rights. You you don't, in the end, what you spoke about and I, and that what I realized is that it's not about all the rights that you took and it was fun, but really the rights that um, if you don't, take the rights, you will regret it. And that's a much stronger pain than, than the joy of the right, probably. What do you think? I agree and I'll, I'll add. So if you take the, li- li- like the book, Live Like a Starter. So I try to like give like tips throughout the entire, every end of the chapter. I give like, so and I thought about it a lot in the end. One a tip, one, one, um, one movie that I like to quote, which relates to a tip, and you talked about it is in The, in the Rise of Life, is, is if you haven't seen the movie, Revolving Doors, uh, go watch it. Because Revolving Doors is a movie that, not a great film, but Gwyneth Paltrow stars there. And the one key premise of the movie is that she comes, there's a horrible day at work. She comes to the tube uh, to take it in London. She arrives and one time she's not able to open up the door and get into the uh, the tube. Hmm. The second one, she hops on the tube And then literally you see two different paths of life, right? One where she hops on, takes you to a certain spot. Another one takes you to a different. And that's why, by the way, so people ask me, do you regret things? Yes. So I I obviously regret not doing certain hopping on, on, on different rides. But in the end, also, it's very important that in the end, I don't regret anything because otherwise I wouldn't be here sitting with you and talking to you because in the end, Think about your life. Like, think how many twists and turns it had that could have thrown you. Not saying it's not a good place to be in, but it would throw you to a completely different um, place, which I think is an interesting concept to, to think about and, and relieve stress a little bit. Because in the end, you get to to uh, to, to to where you want. Um, another question: Yeah, if you do, like, if you do it, there's nothing to regret. Right, because you you've done it. If you don't do it, then it's the if what I could have. Um, even every like, and and I like to think about life, and I talk about it a lot in the book. Again, it's like a it's like a game, like you know. And the ch- biggest cheat sheet in a way is like to 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 understand that you can you are we're obliged to make it fun. What do I mean by making it fun? Life should be fun, but. Let's take, and I write about it also extensively in the book, but like I used to not like flying. Why didn't I love flying? Because it would have been delayed sometimes and it was freaking annoying and whatnot. And so like my friend Libby like told me like, and I had a bit of status because I used to fly a lot. She said, listen, like I made it basically into a game. So every time the flight was late, okay, I pay, I would call them up. I would end the flight, call Delta up. Delta, my flight was late, late by an hour. It made me miss the, you know, and I had to think creatively. It made me miss one, two, three. I used to get $200 back at a minimum. One time I flew, you know, I flew, my beats were frozen. I called up all these kind of things. And then in a way, it makes you either the flight goes on time. And then it's great, went on time. Or there's something goes wrong, but I make it into a game and make money out of it. And then everything is good, right? In the end, if you think about life, and there's a lot of different examples. Like I think if you think about your life, like there's always a way, right? If you think there's always a way, then life becomes like a quest. And then it's interesting. It becomes fun. I'll give, I, I said before, I never paid a single dollar for, for, for school, okay? Let's take 
let's take the Harvard example because I think it's a good I think it's a good example. So I got accepted into Harvard. Um, didn't have money to pay for for that education. Didn't come for money. I had to get a scholarship. I knew I had to get a scholarship. I was then in Canada. Um, um, a scholarship. Megan, a friend there that studied at Harvard, told me about a person that I should talk to. Uri that studied with her at Harvard. I talked to him. He told me about a scholarship from the Jewish community in St. Paul, Minnesota, that called the E. Fishman Scholarship, that every year one Israeli gets full tuition for the Ivy League to study political science, economics, law, etc. One Israeli. Okay, I said, I'll apply. Like, who knows? I applied. Dan Mogelson, the head of the scholarship, calls me up. You need to got to the final 24 of people um, to the scholarship. One to 24. One wins the scholarship. Let's... Keep in mind, he said, get get on the WebEx. I don't know if you remember WebEx. WebEx was what was before Zoom. Yeah. That's how you used to do the, the Cisco company. Okay, get on WebEx. I told him, Dan, I can get on the WebEx. Is it okay if I come to you, to Minnesota? He said, listen, no one has ever asked that before. If you want, pay for your flight, pay for your hotel, and come. So I paid $480, got on a flight from Canada, arrived to Minnesota. If you haven't been to Minnesota in December, I do not recommend that. It is freezing. Didn't have a big budget, so stayed in a Motel 6. Also, not something that I recommend, but a great deal for $19.99. Got a Motel 6. So altogether, I paid $500, arrived to the meeting, to the interview with Dan, and got that $100,000. So I got that full scholarship to Harvard. I put in $500. I got $100,000. I might have got that scholarship and been that one person if I would have gone on that WebEx. Maybe. But I understood that only one is getting this, right? Think about that in the prism of life. If you had a deal now that you had to close, okay, that it's a crazy deal, and you have 23 competitors, wouldn't you fly to that place, stand at the doorstep, of that, you know, CEO or whatever, do that in order to get that deal. Mm -hmm. You would do that. Mm -hmm. But about our life, we don't think about it as a startup. Mm -hmm. That's why I called the book Live Like a Startup. Because in the end, like, don't be that WebEx person. Live like a startup. Like, always find that way. And Dan told me, Yaniv, you were the only one in the history of the scholarship that asked to come to Minnesota. To me, that was mind-boggling. Because other people, they tell them to get on a WebEx, like the hummus trail. They tell you to do this. You do that, but life is a game. One person wins. One person gets a scholarship. Find that way to get that scholarship. I love it so much, man. I love it because I. life has so much to offer. You have so much to gain. What, what do you lose by just, okay, $500, you make it up back if, if you don't get the WebEx, right? So there's so much to gain. And I relate to you so much in coming because coming to the university to, to, to meet the guy. Because I also, before I got accepted to Technion, I had to make an impression. And so I, I was from Indonesia, the country we don't have relationship. So I decided with my dad to come and fly to Israel and talk to the guy at the Technion and we decided to I get accepted. And that, that was my story on how I can get uh, into the Technion. That's the first Indonesian ever. There was never Indonesian before. And so I love that. This is the way you do life. Maximize, just take the risk, be courageous. But what do you aim for? Is there an aim to your life? What is your personal philosophy? It's a great question as well. Uh, so I would say this. So going back to my university, like when I was like you know, 21, I was like disappointed because like, again, I told you, I didn't get accepted into anything. I might have, if I would have, maybe would have gone to study like accounting, mm-hmm. law, medicine, something that, you know, would give you one path. I, I was in 21. I was, I was, I was scared because like I, I, didn't have one path to go down to. Yeah. Um, and and then it was like daunting. Uh, but in the end, that was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. Because I like knew, I thought, okay, I want to be, you know, the Israeli ambassador to the US, right? I want to be the foreign minister. I, I want to do things, mm-hmm. right? There's no one path to get there. And because there's no one path to get there, it made my life much more complicated, but also much easier. Because in the end, I said, okay, I'm just going to do things that I am passionate about, things that I will get new experiences. I always say I like to like look at the, I have like a CV litmus test. When I go and I, I look a lot of CVs of people and I help people as well, like young people. Get, I always tell them that my CV test is like, don't have in your CV something that is the exact same. Don't be a sales representative once and do the same thing. That doesn't, first of all, it doesn't impress me. And 
your CV is so short, right. like you gotta be concise. You gotta build your portfolio into, you know, into into other things. So always in the mindset of like, let's learn new, let's get more experiences and whatnot. Do those things in passion. And if you do them with passion, you'll do them well. And then you build your portfolio, which can take you in many different ways. In the end, you said that I think in a different version before, like looking at, in the end, and I, I didn't understand that then, I understand it now, but like there are so many realities in life. There are so many realities in life. We tend to think that when we are in a reality or think about like when we're in an experience, when you're a student, when you're this, we tend to think that everybody is in that experience. Everybody knows it. This is like life or death. Like it's one thing, you know, but when you think about it and you, and you go through different experiences, only then you understand that it's only one reality. And when you hop out from reality, when we're, when we're, when we're younger, we don't know what we don't know. And we don't know. Um, that there's so many realities. But when you hop into others, you understand, wow, yeah, that was that was an experience. Yeah, that was a time frame. But wow, there are so many others. Think about like multidisciplinary. There's for profit, there's not for profit, there's tech, there's this, there's funds. People have a hard time moving between sectors. I've been I talk about it a lot. I have over 20 years of experience in very multidisciplinary. I was in government, they have funds, I built funds, I was CEO of companies. I was in a for-profit, non-profit intersection between them. People think it's very hard to move between those things. We have a hard time. We think it's so hard because when we're in something, we think that's the world. Right. And that's reality. When in fact, that's not true. There's a lot of things that you can apply to different things, to different places. And when you understand that, first of all, your levels of stress go down because you understand yeah. there's so many realities. Yeah. But also it lets you, you know, take those leaps of faith because, wow, there's so many realities. I'm going to, I'm going to figure out my path. That's going back to your question. I don't believe there's one path, right? I don't believe there is one path that I saw myself going through. I believe as long as you continue to grow, as long as you continue to do interesting things that, you know, in the litmus test, my, my, my litmus test is, is I ask people always when, or also for myself, when I make decisions is like, what do I want to talk about in the Friday night dinner table? So for me, like the Friday night and everyone can take it to their own life. What is the pinnacle like dinner or place of the week, right? Friday night, where I talk to family, friends. I want to talk passionately about what I do. I, when I was at Bird, right, for the first three years, I was talking passionately. After three years, I didn't. Then I understood that I need to think about the next stage. But it, that's what will make it because... The passion and the Friday night dinner table, that makes you understand, okay, what is good for you at this point? That could be, everybody says, okay, Google is a great company. This startup, wow, I want to be there. But for you, maybe your boss there is a shit show, right? Or any other reasons that you want to grow into something and know yourself and what you want to talk about is a great limit as to understanding where you are and where you need to move to. When I was like, before Bird, I had five different offers. I wanted to do like, again, something with impact, for profit. I had five different offers. I didn't know exactly how to choose. When I put that in the frame of Friday night dinner table, it was crystal clear that Bird is where I want to be. Because for me, that was the right point at that time. It was a company that was the way to become the fastest ever unicorn in the history of the world. After eight months, I was there after three months, but I understood the trajectory. It was a way to understand, okay, I'm here for me. That was great because my bosses were not in Israel. I knew for myself, Yaniv, that was something that was, was, was good at that point. Building something from zero, understanding that this is the right point for me. The point is like, ask yourself that because if you're still, and, and then if you're on the path to that and continuing in that journey, you'll get to a place. Where is good for you? That's the most important thing in life, I think. I think of each human life. If you think of humanity like a person and each of us like the brain, neurons, a single neuron in humanity's mind, I think of our entire life like this new experience. If we experience or did something new, it's a new knowledge or new skill that humanity earns. So if you just live a life that has been lived before, you're not contributing anything, I think, to humanity. But this is what I'm trying to aim, to do stuff that hasn't been done before. To do it first or to do it best? Yeah, I think yes. But I also think, to be honest, is that in the end, it's each person knows himself the best. And, and for, for another person, that might not be what is the most important. 
right? So, so for someone else, it can be, I am getting my passion and my in something else. And, mm-hmm. and I see a different path. As long as you feel as if you're progressing, as if you are happy with where you are, you're learning, you're growing. To me, the growth, whatever you, by the way, do, as long as you grow and you're happy and you're passionate, then that is great. Beautiful. Talk a bit about your experience with ADHD. I had ADHD when I was young, couldn't sit in class. My parents got called in multiple times. And actually my dad just posted this year. Is he messing with our students? Is he hurting people? If not, then let him run around. He's a kid, right? What is your experience? So first of all, that's amazing. ADHD, to me, it was like, you know, it was, it was, it was not something I was proud of when I grew up. Like, okay, I am, by the way, when I grew up, there was only two in my entire class. Um, out of 180 today you know it became a bigger you know phenomena um, from that perspective but to me why do i have i was by the way i'm also dysgraphic i have adhd um, etc so for a lot of time it was like oh, why do i have adhd understanding today not from today for a while now that is the best thing that happened to me because having adhd and being restless in a way, made me experience so many things, hop hop on so many rides, because I couldn't stay still in one ride. And then I got, and I built my portfolio around that. So for me, that was one of the best things I got, if that makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. Energy is is the one biggest leverage with with that condition. (laughs) And I think being restless, wanting to try everything life has to offer gives you tremendous benefit instead of just sitting down, living the normal life, safe life, the homeless trail, right? It's, it's not it's not fun. One thing that people with a lot of interest do, like me, is, is to do student entrepreneurship, trying to build a company. What advice or what experience you had uh, or seeing other people trying to do this that you can give? So I think one thing is don't give up. I, am, I think continue, you know, find uh, what it is and and don't try there's great stories you know people will tell you no over and over and over again it's great the founder of airbnb um you know talks about it that he got 150 no's for funding when airbnb he was going to he was going to raise a hundred and fifty thousand dollars an evaluation of 1.5 million Hmm. the original 100 billion dollars is probably the number He says, Brian Chesaki says that even one of those knows of a VC that should know what is right said, your market is not big enough for the investment, which is, you know, in retrospective, it's like, you know, bullshit. So, so on one hand, don't, don't, don't think that other people know better than you, you know, which is something that we sometimes tend, oh, he told me this, so I won't, you know, trust your Trust your instincts. You know probably well, live your experience. Like I live in a bird. I understood why it makes sense, mm-hmm. you know, why it makes sense now. And get, try to also, you know, go with people that, that are entrepreneurs. Like you're learning, you know, learning that mindset is very, very important. Um, and you can get it through a variety of different ways. I, you know, love, you know, joining people that, are entrepreneurs because you get different perspectives. And I think that's something. I also think that one of the most, if not the most important qualities for an entrepreneur uh, is the ability to know how to sell. want to encourage you all to get that experience as early as possible in life. I got that experience after the military when I went to go sell Dead Sea Cosmetics in Toronto. Canada. Yeah, Exactly, in Toronto, in, in New York there. And I, I sold, I didn't get money if I didn't sell. And that's where I got my self-confidence. I learned, that going back to that empathy, I understood exactly who am I targeting? What am I selling? And I was the best salesperson there. And it gave me a lot of confidence. But more than that, it's because it doesn't matter if I sell Dead Sea Cosmetics, scooters, eyelashes, or anything else. In the end, each moment of our life, especially when you're an entrepreneur, you're selling yourself. Selling yourself comes from having that confidence and knowing how to sell. Um, so I think that is probably the most important quality for an entrepreneur. Because a lot of times on your entrepreneurship route, you're going to have a bit of that, you know, fake it till you make it, which I really recommend to do. And when I say fake it till you make it, I don't say create a new picture. 
create something from zero because that's just lying, yeah. right? But, you know, there's a great phrase in Hebrew, which means, you know, go a bit around the corners. And that's okay. Because in the end, on my entrepreneurship journey, I always went a bit around the corners. And it doesn't matter, you know. In the end, there's a great book, Sheryl Sandberg, Lean In, um, which is a great book. And yeah. she says there a stat that women... 96% of them, if they don't, if, if they have a, a job that they're applying for, if they don't mark 100%, like all the criteria, don't apply. Men, right. 60% apply. It doesn't matter if you have four years of experience or five years of experience. It doesn't really matter. Try. You know, worst case scenario, will tell you, yes, fake it a bit until you make it. So... That mindset is super crucial you know, for an entrepreneur. And understand your market, understand where you're coming from. Because in the end, again, you know best. And one thing that one of my mentors always said, and I always like to think about it when I come to make decisions. Um, at Harvard, his name is Ron Heifetz. Um, and he is a professor for adaptive leadership. He has a great book. You read it and um, no easy answers. And he talks about his one line, one of his lines is take a step from the dance floor to the balcony um, when you come to make decisions, when you think, because in the end, when you're on the dance floor, you only see the dance floor. Like you see the dance floor. When you go up to the balcony, then you actually see it, you know, accurately. I talk a lot about for entrepreneurs and for general people, like go get a global perspective, like go live abroad, live abroad like you're doing. Mm -hmm. Go live, you know, live abroad. Because when you take a step to the balcony, okay, live abroad, then you see yourself in a different way. You see where you come from, from a different way. And you understand how what you do is so non-trivial in a way. And that is for an entrepreneur, I think, super important to understand that your story is unique. The fact that you're in some place, take a step out. Okay, not everybody is like that. I think about Israelis go back to the military, right? It's mandatory in Israel. Yes. So everybody has the military. You're next to, you know, people from, you know, your unit. So you think everybody is like that because that's who you are with, right? Come at that reality. When you go abroad to do that homeless trail, you see people from other, other, you know, telling you, wow, that's super unique. Then you understand not everybody does that journey. And when you understand that as an entrepreneur and understand it makes you be able to find those opportunities that are either not existent or are unique based on your experience. I want to touch on two points that you mentioned. I love it so much. One from Brian Chesky, founder of Airbnb. Also, he added that your personal development must always exceed your company's development. It improves you so much. Okay, if you fail the company, whatever. But you have changed so much. Like you said, with sales, it doesn't matter what you sell. You gain this ability to sell. Besides, the world is run by people. So you got you to gotta be able to deal with people anyway in whatever you do. And the second point is about exploration, really. In life, people want to get so dedicated sharp shooter in the, in so uh, in a early phase of your life they don't they don't explore but if you step back and really see where you can really fit uh, you will get a stronger fit in your career than if you like specialize early on totally i completely agree by the way that's something i wanted to write an article one day about because i i totally agree i also think though for entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs 100 percent but also again it goes back to what we said before know yourself because I wanted to write an article like around um, specialist or generalist versus expert, right? So there's people, know yourself. Are you a generalist or are you an expert, okay? Because if you're an expert, then certain things, you know, and I had, you know, a good friend of mine, Danny Bahar, he's an ama amazing friend. He's a, he's a, you know, as a, he's an economist of Harvard, did like the rank, and he's an expert. I could never do a doctor. Going back to my ADHD, for instance, myself, yeah. but I, I could never, you know, I'm a generalist. I like to, ex to experience, you know, all these things. So know about yourself, you know, who you are in order to understand. And exactly like you said, like, get the, try it out. Try it out early on to understand, like, what you are. And once you understand what, similar to, like, in a way, like, the lean startup, right? Mm -hmm. Go try the POC and then understand where your vision is and, and run with it. I think we've sort of answered this earlier, but I want to hear more of your thoughts. Is intelligence a winning survival trait? Say more. Thinking more about biology. If you think about ants, they've existed for a long time before us and maybe after us, but, but they're not really smart, are they? They don't think about insurance. But humans, we our strategy is to develop this mind. 
And yet a lot of people struggle in life because they think too much. They are they're prodigies and they are so gifted, but they, they miss the bigger picture. Um, so I think it also goes back, and you've said it about like, first of all, I want to break down intelligence a bit because I think that there is the different types of intelligence, right? And a lot of, and it goes back again, there's a lot of things we can connect to what we said previously, but like even around numbers, right? And, 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 and your, your exam scores, right? And then some people, you know, that is intelligence, right? But it's not, there's like the seven type of intelligence and like, you know, social intelligence is much more, it's not much more important, but equally important in a different way to achieve success, you know, in life. And that goes back to the empathy people, um, et cetera. And I, and, I, and I think that, you know, when people hear this and whatnot, they, and when I grew up, by the way, I, I didn't see that because society teaches you that the scores are what are, that's the kind of intelligence that is, that is important. And your, and your, and your, your typecast is based on that, et cetera, et cetera. But I think there's a variety of, of different intelligences and, and, and not one is not better than the other. There's also not one leadership trait that is more important than the other. We can talk about that later on as well. So I, I think intelligence is, in essence, I just think in terms of clarity, how that intelligence comes into play mm. is super crucial on the journey of life. Got it. Yeah, and if I want to make a quick tangent to what's going on right now in the world, AI is, is very prevalent. What are your thoughts on it? I think it's amazing. I think AI, and by the way, that's also around like, Timing is everything in life, right? Like AI has been here for several yeah. years. Yeah. I did, I remember I did the executive program of Singularity University, which is like the university of the future in Silicon Valley, where they talk about the future. AI, that was 2018. That was okay. It's, it's coming. It's here. I think the one thing that is different this time, you know, which started last year, open AI, chat GPT, whatever, a year and a half ago, was how, how it was applicable to the masses and how it was able to, um, you know, get an adoption rate, right? It was actually something that was a use case that people could actually use. Chat GPT, they could actually use. I think that the AI itself was here. Putting it into practicality is so important. Also, when you think about your entrepreneurship journey and coming up with something, how do you make it applicable to people? How do you not think about it in a theoretical way? How do you make it like something that is some someone can use it and understand the use case? Hmm. And I think that is the big shift here for AI, which is only going to... And once you did that, then the sky is the, is the limit because then you have the adoption. People are looking at it in a different way. Apps are being built, et cetera. Hmm. I think AI, I think AI is, is one of the biggest revolutions that has happened to us. Um, and I think you can look at it and I like to look at it also in like the micro, like, like the small thing, like literally I have friends that used to, you know, that are, um, that are Israeli and their English is not that great. And they used to like send me literally like every few days, like, okay, I'm writing this email. Can you go over it and make it like, you know, a fazaz English. Yeah. And they haven't talked to me for a couple of years now because like. They don't need me anymore. There's like, you know, ChatGPT. It's amazing. It does that. And and I think like that's the micro example of how something like that can just make such a shift on people's everyday life. But I also think that it's something that, you know, with every evolution, always there's it's always like a, a bell curve, right? Like, okay, now there's the, the you know, the all the like, you know, privacy. Like there's so many issues that, yeah. that come up with every kind of you know technology that comes comes our way i know it also from you know by the way not only from technology from everything it's always the same parabola when you think about it even charity scooters came up then okay it was scary you know you can look at it and we'll find a way to make it right in the end murphy's so, law because right you have adoption once you have adoption and it's in the masses then then it's there that's like the tipping that's the tipping point that it's there. Now it's just figuring out some of like charity scooters, how to do it in the right way, mm. right? Okay, or how Henry Ford, okay, we're moving from carriages into cars. When carriages moved to cars, people wanted faster horses, as we said. People didn't understand why you even need cars. There were, people didn't want cars. When cars came out, there was a big ban on them. People said, no, if they're dangerous. And then look at what happened. Sidewalks were created because of cars. Right. 
And so it's a lot of things were created based on that paradigm, which moved the world in a, in a good way, you know, forward. And then it's all about finding balance, which that's a key in life in general. So innovation is inevitable. So we just got to adapt, you know, move ourselves around it. But we discussed not before. only, not only that it's inevitable, it's inevitable and it's a positive thing. Yeah, it is positive. And talking about how humans run the world. And so we got to be good at, you know, interacting and dealing with humans. But what if that were to change with AI in the future? How should we prepare, man? How should we, what should we double down on one thing about humans' qualities that AI could never have? I think the number one thing that I don't think AI can ever have is that people, people skills, that, that, you know, soft intelligence. Um, and those are things that um, we should double down on ourselves as humans. And um, the double down because the writing code doing that will be solved. But the ability of the empathy, the ability of the person of, of the person to be really a manager and to understand that I don't see it going away. That's my thought. So in a way, AI is helping humans become more human. AI is helping humans become more human, I think. And I think it's just making humans become more um Yanif. Talking about Israel, what is one thing that's different in Israel entrepreneurship and how is it you know, compared to other countries? Because it is quite a unique place, this, this country where people had to go to military, you know, travel the world. It's, it's very unique. So I think one thing that is very unique about us is that, you know, it's enough to look at a map of the world. I mean, if you look at a map of the world, we are in, we are a small country, less than 10 million people. It's actually interesting that 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 um that number because um there used to be uh, there was a survey that was done um asking people in Europe what is the size of Israel and the vast majority said that it was the size of France or Germany so like tens of millions of people because that's how much you hear about it in the news that's how much how much fuss we make in the world but in the end we're a small freaking country. And we're surrounded by enemies, which means that not only that we're surrounded by enemies, but we're also, you know, you do the military, you are always in the constant state of, you know, elimination. You're always, you don't know what tomorrow will bring. And it's very similar in a way to a life of an entrepreneur, right? Of a startup. We're still a startup. Being in that way, that's a mentality. And people, you know, in Israel, like, take risks. They you know, um, are, are able to do that. Um, and also you mentioned the military. The military has a lot to do with it as well because, you know, we're, we're all connected. So one degree of separation in Israel, people usually start their companies with units. But, but I also think that just in general, we're innovative, you know, and innovative as a, as a way of life because we don't know what will be tomorrow. We don't know. I used to remember, you know, I used to come back from the military. I was a combat you know, soldier used to come like five, you know, I used to, at 9 a.m., I used to arrive on a Friday, I used to have to go back 5 a.m. on a Sunday, I used to arrive, we'll sleep two hours and go party. Mm -hmm. You know, not really normal, but when you think that you don't know what will be the next time you come back, like you live, you take risks, you fail, you try again. Yep. You do it, you go, you know, and there's, you don't have the luxury as Israel to give up. Because if we'll give up, there's not going to be a country. And it's the same for the human. If you, if, you know, so it's, so you don't give up. We, Israelis are, you know, very blunt. Israelis are very to the point because there's no time for bullshit, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I think those are, there are a lot of interesting characteristics that come into play. I like the part where you're saying Israel is small, but it makes a lot of noise. We have a saying in Indonesian, Chabia Rawit, which is basically a small pepper, which is very spicy, but it's very small. It's like the size of your uh, fingernail. And that's what Israel is. It's very small, but so influential, which is surprising to me that people in you know, the survey thought it's the size of France or, or Germany. That's why there's this kid in the other side of the world, Indonesia, who came here to find out. Amazing. I love, I love the analogy. Before we close this down, one thing you are working on, what should we know? How do we keep up with Yannick Rivlin? What are you up to? Uh, first of all, you keep up with LinkedIn or, or any other. Uh, it's the best platform probably. To keep up with, first of all, 
you know, the, the book is out in English now. So I hope you have a chance to read it. Live like a startup. And there's a lot of what we talked here and, and, and more. So I'm doing also a lot of talks to companies, to groups, um, et cetera, about that like kind of mindset of live like a startup. I've been also working on, uh, on some very interesting things in terms of an investment uh, fund here in the periphery of Israel. So this is the book, by the way, Live Like a Startup. Um, and I write in the end, I'll read the last two paragraphs, but I think they're, they're, they're great if you're okay with it. So, um, so my last two paragraphs of the book, okay? So what's next? Honestly, I don't have an answer to that question. If you would have asked me five years ago whether I'd create and spearhead the shared e-scooter sector, I probably would have laughed right in your face. Precisely how I would have reacted if you would have told me 25 years ago that I'd be accepted into Harvard. What I do know, however, is that whatever I'll do, it'll make my, I'll make myself the right, I'll ask myself the right questions beforehand. Those same questions that led me to write this book. I know this much about my next rules. They'll be about improving the face of society, both in Israel and beyond. They'll be meaningful and challenging, and they'll wake me up each morning with a sense of joy and excitement for the day ahead. And even then, I'll be on the lookout for the next big thing. And then as I wrote this, the book came out in Hebrew close to two years ago, by the way. As I mentioned, I have ADHD. I'm this graphic. I don't know how to write. Yet this book got to number one in Israel. It was the number one best-selling book. And the reason it became a best-selling book is because I took a ghostwriter to do it. Because otherwise, there would never be a book. Outsourcing is one of my values in life. But we'll put that aside. So uh, two years ago, I put out the book, got to number one. I decided to write it in English as well. So I did that. I was debating if to add another chapter because in two years, many things went by. Yeah. But in the end, I decided to write actually this, which is an editor, an editor's note. I chose not to alter this book after it was first published in Hebrew. Despite the changes that occurred in my life, I left Bird and now had an investment fund for the advancement of Israel's periphery and traveled to speaking engagements across the globe. I lost my dad and I became a dad. After all, the principles and insights that have always guided me haven't changed. All of this and more will wait patiently for the next book. So in the end, what I want to say is that we always have, oh, we always have exciting things ahead. Things come, things, things, uh, things progress. Be true to yourself and continue to grow. That's the most important, important thing. Because again, we don't know what we don't know. And only if we get out of our comfort zone, then those new opportunities grow. When you get out of your comfort zone, there's basically three phases. Get out of your comfort zone, there's fear, then learning, then growth. You can't go out into growth without going through that fear stage. I've gone through many fear stages in my life. It's easy to stay in your comfort zone. But if you go through that fear, you'll learn and you'll grow. So I want to encourage us all to, to get out of that comfort zone because that's what'll make us grow. There's a great song by Simon and Garfunkel in Sound of Silence. And it goes, hello, darkness, my old friend. I come to talk to you again, right? And that darkness, you want to see it because when you see that and an entrepreneur has so many moments and days of that, like, you know, that's what makes you go through it. Beautiful, beautiful. This whole podcast has been a masterclass. You spit so much knowledge and wisdom in every five seconds. You speak with passion and God knows we need this more than you benefit from this podcast. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you and I'd love to keep in touch. Thank you, my friend. And we will and continue to, to do your important work and spread the word. I hope many people listen to the podcast and feel free to, you know, as I write at the end of the book, I give my email, I give my phone number, like I'm here and live your life like a startup. Amazing. Yanif, thank you very much. Ciao, ciao.